So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining our HERN Human Islet Research Network webinar series. Um, we're trying to give these at least quarterly, maybe more frequently in the future. And today's topic will be designing tools and materials to create a benchtop window into the islet immune interface. Um, really glad you're all here. Again, please mute your video and your microphone uh, while you're listening. You can use the chat button for questions and answers. If you have anything you want to pose to the speakers, could you please uh, put it in the chat? <clears throat> I'm Joyce Nyland. I'm the chair of the Department of Di Diabetes and Cancer Discovery Science at City of Hope, which is in Southern California, and also principal investigator of the HERN Coordinating Center or Enhancement Center, as we call it. Mm -hmm along with my co-PI, Dr. John Cadiz. Today's speakers are going to be <clears throat> Dr. Sherry Stabler, Dr. Luke Tayton, Leanna Peters, Diane Steyer, Daniel Steyer, sorry, and Dan Hugh. <clears throat> and um, we have a very interesting uh, set of materials from the chip. Well, they sent a list of all the speakers. And could everybody uh, mute if you, yeah, thank you. Here's an overview of today's webinar. If you can oh, advance. So we're going to give you a brief introduction to the Human Islet Research Network, in case you're not familiar. And then there'll be an introduction to one of the five consortia, the Consortium on Human Islet Biomimetics. And then there'll be presentations on single cell gene expression analysis, TCR sequencing and avatar T cells, gene editing of primary human cells and human iPSCs, Sensing pancreatic islet secretions with microfluidic devices and vascular networks in microphysiological systems. We'll hold the questions until the end, unless you have a, a point of clarification that's very important. If you would just put it in the chat, and Dr. Stabler is going to um, be the MC to moderate the questions at the end. Next slide, please. So, as in the human islet research network or HERN, the goal is to better understand how human beta cells are lost in this disease and <clears throat> how we can rapidly develop innovative strategies to protect or replace beta cell function in diabetic patients. The interesting and exciting thing is it brings together over 200 scientists and their laboratories from many diverse fields, biology, immunology, microengineering. So it's a real model of collaborative science. Uh, we support it by, via the Hearn Enhancement Center, or HIRIC, which is located at City of Hope. And over on the right is an example of one of the executive summary reports we've done four years so far, working on years five and six combined now. You can download them or look at them at the hearnnetwork.org website given below. And this one features um, the islet on the chip from the CHIB Consortium. And you're going to hear more about their exciting discoveries. Next slide, please. So the HERN consists of five consortia today. It's expanded since it was first founded. The Consortium on Modeling and Autoimmune Interactions, or CMI, CDBS, the Consortium on Beta Cell Death and Survival. HPAC is the Human Pancreas Analysis Consortium. And then we have CTAR, which is the Consortium on Targeting and Regeneration and the consortium that we're featuring today, the Consortium on Human Islet Biomimetics. And then surrounding all of this and supporting and facilitating the science is the HIREC, which, which we run. Next. And I just want to make you aware also on our, our website at hernnetwork.org, um, you can all go there. There's a public component to it and you could get to the network uh, research network resource browser. Next build, please. Highlighted here. And there are over a thousand resources out there for your perusal and, and use. There are many antibodies described, mouse strains, cell lines, data sets, viruses and vectors, and protocols. And we're going back to the HERN website. <laughs> so let's go forward. Got quite a lag today. I'm not quite sure why. And you can go to the next slide. And I think that's it. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Sherry Stabler, who's going to give you an introduction to CHIB. Sherry. Thank you, Dr. Mueller. 
Um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to go over this very briefly, but I wanted to make sure to introduce um, all the players or the key players on the, on the teams and introduce some of the concepts that we're covering in CHIB so that hopefully those of you that are interested in these topics have points of contact to reach out um, and discuss uh, potential collaborations or things that you're interested in or tools that you've seen in, in this. Let's see. So these are the CHIP teams that are currently funded by the uh, Hearn, by Hearn. So these are our CHIP teams. We have four teams and you can see um, they're comprised of very large groups from with very different backgrounds. Um, so we have the um, modular monitoring of hormonal re release in human islets. And um, we have presentation from that group today, uh, as well as engineering the uh, human microphysiological system for the characterization of islet immune interactions. Um, and you'll hear from Liana um, from our group there today. Uh, MPS systems for modeling autoimmunity. And you'll hear from um, Dr. Uh, from Dan on that. And then um, also a vascularized islet biomimetic model and you're from Luke on that side. So just to talk about what are the programmatic goals, the ultimate goal really is to develop an in vitro human disease model. We know that we can't completely recapitulate uh, type one diabetes outside of the body, um, but it's to try and develop a window into some of the aspects of pathophysiology of type one diabetes. The goal is to do this using human cells because that will provide unique insights. So using T1D patient derived islets with autologous immune components, and then to use microphysiological systems that allow us to have long-term culture and control over those stimuli. So allowing for these kind of interactions to be studied between beta cells and immune cells. And I hope that today we'll highlight some of those tools that have been developed as part of the consortium um, that have broad applications. So just to briefly highlight the projects, um, this project is led by um, Dr. Roper at FSU, and, and the idea of being able to develop sensors that would allow for um, easy assessment and characterization of human islets. So monitoring hormonal release in particular, which those of us that work in that space would save thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, probably a week um, if we were able to get away from ELISA's and have um, those aspects of being able to study that. We also have um, our, our um, funded grant, which is working to basically translate the island on chip device. So this looks a little familiar if you've seen before from Joyce's presentation. So our chip device that uh, houses islets and being able to um, both image and characterize uh, do dynamic glucose stimulated insulin releases. And then now we're translating that to be able to look at the island immune interface. And so we're incorporating sensors and developing an island immune niche and enhance spatial stimulatory control, as well as uh, protocols for being able to generate isogenic cell lines and systems to be able to assess uh, these islets in situ under flow and to potentially study islet immune interactions of immune cells with islet spheroids. Let's see if I can go to the next slide. Oh, I went too fast, sorry about that. So the next group is led by Stanger at Penn. Um, and you can see it has a very multidisciplinary team as well uh, with multiple goals. And basically these are UG3, UG4 mechanisms where UG3 is establishing the protocols and the platforms, reproducible protocols and platforms. And then UG4 is really then playing around with those tools. Um, so they're seeking to develop, again, these isogenic cell types, uh, develop models of T-cell mediated immunity and establish these iPSC lines that are reporters of beta cell stress and death. And they've been able to develop platforms as you'll hear more about in Dan's talk uh, that are vascularized. So these vascularized platforms that islets contain within them and then a wealth of toolbox uh, tools um, to be able to study the island immune interface. The, uh, another grant is um, led by the Sanders Group at UCSD. Again, exploring similar topics in islet immune infiltration. They have a different model that they're exploring. Um, but it is again a vascularized model leveraging on a platform that's, that's already been developed in that space. Um, so I hope that gives you a flavor of some of the work that's ongoing in the CHIB consortium, as well as some contact people to um, be able to reach out in case there's some things of interest. Thank you. Can't move on to the next slide, but I believe that's... There we go, Dr. Tayton. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So it's the first of a kind, I wasn't really sure who would be listening to it on the type of things we needed to deliver. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to give you some overview of what we are doing in our group, the, the Sander use uh, UG3 team, not UC3, I'm sorry about the typo. Um, I'm an immunologist at Scripps Research, where I've been for 30 years, interested in type 1 diabetes for 25 of, of the 30 years. And I'm going to give you the overview of what 
on why we use single cell gene expression on make avatar T cells in the context of studying type 1 diabetes. So um, like everybody, I've been spoiled for the first 20 years of my uh, studying of type 1 by the mouse model. The NOD that is, as everybody knows, a very, very good model of the human disease, but um, we're just you know, spoiled by having access to the animal, its entirety. We can get the spleen, we can get the pancreatic lymph node, and of course we can get the islets. Um, we get plenty of cells and we can do all kinds of experiments, uh, transfer studies, transgenic mice, CFSC dilution studies, whatever type of T-cell activation in vitro and in vivo. Um, it's all good and beautiful, but uh, when we look in the blood, which is when we do translational studies, the only compartment we have access to, now we have a problem. Uh, the problem, the front of it is numbers. So even if we have reagents like MHE or HLA tetramers, to pull out antigen specific CD8 or CD4 T cells, we end up from 10 or 20 ml of blood having very, very few cells. So we were all stuck there for 25 years. And about five years ago, there was a convergence of an explosion of technologies that allowed us to, to finally move into real translational studies. So, uh, Microfluidic was a big part of it because it gave us access to two things that we talk about today. One of them to be able to study cell one at a time in microfluidic devices that allow you to uh, do all kinds of studies like gene expression or, or sequencing studies of single cells. And then uh, you've seen a couple of slides already of those devices where we can uh, constitute vasculature, put islets and eventually flow T cells um, to maybe model type 1 diabetes on a chip. In all of those studies, if we, like immunologists, want to study the T cells, again, we are back to the situation in blood, confronted to very, very few cells, and we only can study one at a time. So people have been studying human T cells in the context of type 1 for, for decades now. Um, you can make T-cell clones like Sally has done. Um, it's very tedious. It's not, you know, able in many labs. It's an infrastructure that is, you know, cumbersome. It, it's very time consuming. They are very difficult to keep. Um, the easy answer to that is sequence the T-cell receptor and put it into an avatar T-cell uh, that is a TCR negative T cell that can be a primary or an immortalized cell line. And now you can study the, the T cell receptor on the reactivity of those clones. Um, it's all good and fine, but I don't think the interrogation of the T cell receptor is the only thing we need. We also need to know to go into mechanistic studies and eventually understand the mechanism of activation of those cells to go for the single cell RNA-seq, to go for the interrogation of particular pathways of activation. And that's where the single cell technology and gene expression analysis are critical. Because in the end, that's what we are studying. That's a human islet on, in white, you have C4 T cells. That's a person from NPOD. Um, you see that you have very, very few of those cells. And of course, when they go into the peripheral blood, they'll be diluted even more. Um, the situation in one of those microfluidic devices that we are talking about is going to be very, very similar. Very few islets, very few cells, very few cells that are going to be interested in the islet. So we need single cell technologies to address uh, those T cells and be able to answer some of the mechanistic studies that we are interested in. So, as I mentioned, we started about five years ago. The concept was to try to completely change the way that we study mice and model the studying of mice on the studying of humans. So you only have access to peripheral blood, and that's what you're going to be doing with mice. Um, we have the luxury of making MHD tetramers, and we could sort 
against insulin CD40 cells, and we've done that in mouse, and now we do it in humans, and we follow exactly the same scheme. So we have an upfront uh, cytometry labeling of the cells. We sort them one at a time in 96 well plates, and then we can do, using the fluidime suite of instrumentation, everything we want, which is gene expression analysis, RNA-seq, on the sequencing of the TSA receptor. And then we can make avatar T cells, and we can look at the reactivity of those T cells against the islet themselves, or iPSC-derived beta cells, or against whatever peptide MHC that is in recombinant form. So if I can go to the next slide, which eventually will happen. Uh, the single cell gene expression analysis is very, very powerful. So you can sort your cells in five microliters of reverse transcription. You go for the reverse transcription and now we pre-amplify the plate with 200 pairs of primers that are covering those genes that I've highlighted on the slide, which are all the activation genes in the T cell, all the surface molecules of interest, the cytokine, the transcription factors, the adhesion molecule, all the signaling molecule uh, modules on metabolic modules that we can interrogate. Um, then we split that plate in two. We run a qPCR on the two plates. On now we know the level of expression in any of those cells for 192 genes. In addition to it, we also preamplify and then can sequence the alpha on beta chain. Uh, cDNA of the particular T cell receptor that is expressed in that particular cell. So it's all good and beautiful. And then of course, you have to do the analysis that is very, very complicated, very cumbersome. We ended up devising our own pipeline of analysis to end up producing new maps of gene expression on differential gene expression analysis. Um, the bottom line, if all goes well, you know exactly the state of activation of a primary T cell that you've pulled out from the peripheral blood. Um, you know also, ideally, the T cell receptor pair of that particular T cell. And you can study the T cell based on, on the data that you've got. So that's one of those examples, you know, the sequencing, we've published that per hand sequencing using the uh, MySeq uh, platform. I have to, I think it's an important point to say that every run doesn't work exactly the way that you expect. Uh, the number of paired sequences is variable. 40 to 60% is an average. Uh, the only cells that sequence are the ones that are activated. If the cell is not activated, you may get one of the two chains, you rarely get both. It's very, very difficult. But then it's very easy to make those TCR that we've sequenced, put them into a PMIG or whatever retroviral type vector that you like. And we then express them um, in MN279, which has CD4 also uh, transfected in. And we can look at the reactivity at the top are two clones, one is against the C peptide, one is against B9223. And we can look also at primary cells like the endo C cell that we've transfected with DQ8 and we see that we have reactivity. So you can reconstitute the TCR specificity or reactivity. For us, the main interest of the exercise is to qualify the region that we use up front, which is a tetramer. We want to make sure that the specificity of the tetramer is what it's supposed to be. A tetramer for 1321 has to be against 1321, and one against the C peptide has to recognize the particular epitope on the C peptide that we're interested in. Beside that, of course, we can do biophysical and social studies, but I don't think that's where the most of the information is going to come from. It's important to have, it's part of the registry of things that we establish. But the most important part is to have the gene expression of those primary cells that circulate in the blood that are reactive against insulin in our case, and are probably critical 
for the progression of disease. So I will stop there. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> because I, I'm, I'm getting at nine minutes, I have my timer in front of me. I was gonna be you know, tapped on the fingers. But I think that the single cell technology, human studies or the studies on chip, what's gonna be the most useful to all of us is to use the single cell gene expression analysis. And you don't have to do full single cell RNA seq if you have a good panel of genes, if you can interrogate 200 genes for each of the cells you're looking at, you will know the one that are activated. You'll know the program of activation. You'll know what type of cytokines they make. And you can determine what type of target therapeutically could be applied to block those T cells. So I think it's a wonderful tool. It's a very mature field. It's extremely reliable, robust. The problem is that it's very expensive. So every patient we look at or every chip in which we've put T cells, you're talking up front probably at $3,000 per experiment. So that, that's expensive. As I mentioned, TCR sequencing or expression, certain variability of it. So far we've looked at, I don't know, 700 different sequences. We don't find clones that are coming up across patients, you know, everybody has his own repertoire. There are technical issues that are linked to the quality of the, the my 6 sequencing or the ion torrent. If you're using the ion torrent, it's also very expensive regardless of the platform you use. Uh, but of course, in the back of it, you can do mechanistic studies, which are the biophysics of the interaction on some structural studies that are always nice to look at. And I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tayton. Um, bringing up next is Liana Peters, who is a um, graduate student in the laboratory of Dr. Todd Brusco. Thank you, Liana. Thank you, Dr. Stabler. Uh, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about our work here in the Brusco and a little bit of uh, the Matthews lab as well in editing primary human T cells and iPSCs. Sorry, sped ahead a little bit there. Okay, so there are a number of um, key cellular interactions in the context of type 1 diabetes that we're interested in recapitulating and studying further in our system. So notably, I'll talk today about uh, looking at the interactions of APCs with T cells, as well as endothelial cell T cell interactions and the interaction of cytotoxic T lymphocytes with their beta cell targets. And as has been stated multiple times already, now, uh, our main goal is to generate this isogenic system in which, in a particular assay, all cells uh, that we use are derived from the same donor. And this is of particular importance um, for our projects because we're really interested in interrogating how some of these uh, T1D candidate genes might influence uh, these cellular interactions. And the Matthews Lab uh, has been spearheading this effort on the side of um, iPSCs in which they've been able to differentiate these into multiple cell types. Um, and in the Brusco lab, we're interested in the T cell component of disease. So I'll talk about our uh, work in uh, interrogating the function of antigen specific T cells. So as I said, Matthew's lab um, has worked a lot in differentiating these iPSCs into various uh, cell types, but they've also um, optimized a protocol to achieve high efficiency editing of single nucleotide polymorphisms within some of these key type 1 diabetes uh, risk genes. So notably PTPN22, IFIH1, and SH2B3. And after this editing process, they achieve um, within the same donor cells uh, that are homozygous for the minor and major allele. And they will differentiate these into uh, innate immune cell subsets, as well as endothelial cells and beta cells. And in our lab, in the Brusco laboratory, as I mentioned, we're interested in studying um, antigen-specific T cell function. So in order to do this, uh, we need to generate T cells which are specific for uh, beta cell antigens. And we do this through lentiviral transduction. Um, but the main uh, consideration for this process is that when you introduce a new T cell receptor, there's the potential for mispairing here between uh, the endogenous TCR chains and uh, the TCR which you've just introduced. So the 
uh, main uh, way that's been proposed to deal with this is to use gene editing technologies to delete the endogenous T cell receptor to reduce some of this mispairing. So we have employed this strategy in our lab utilizing uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 system in which we have designed guide RNA that's specific for the T cell receptor alpha chain constant region or TRAC. And you can see as validation here when we perform our TRAC knockout, uh, the vast majority of cells fall here in the double negative quadrant for uh, TCR, alpha, beta, and CD3. Whereas in the negative control, we see the vast majority are double positive as we would expect. And uh, we've extended the utility of this protocol past um, editing the TCR and into deleting some uh, type 1 diabetes candidate genes. Um, notably, CD226, as I've mentioned here, it's a co-stimulatory receptor that our lab is interested in. So I wanted to show a little bit more data just um, showing that we can achieve comparable editing efficiency in both CD4 and CD8 T cells as seen here by uh, this comparable percentage of cells that are double negative for TCR alpha beta and CD3. This is represented graphically here. And um, what we wanted to next do after we validated the high efficiency knockout here is to see whether or not the um, knockout of the endogenous TCR would confer enhanced antigen specificity. And we do this through um, uh, MHC text dextromer reagents. And in this case, um, we're looking at CD8 T cells for our IGRP avatars. So we use an MHC class one dextromer reagent with IGRP peptide that our TCR should be able to bind to. And these dextromers also have fluorophores on the backbone that enable you to visualize uh, your binding via flow cytometry. So as you can see in our uh, no electroporation condition, we have about 10% of our cells that are binding the IGRP dextromer. While in our negative control, which only receives the um, electroporation conditions, uh, but no editing, we see about 5%. And in our track knockout, we see a significant increase in the number of cells that are able to bind dextromer here at 60%. Shown here for uh, the whole cohort, where you can see that the track knockout uh, does seem to confer some uh, increased antigen specificity, potentially uh, due to this reduced mispairing. So next we want to see uh, whether or not this increased antigen specificity would translate to increased antigen specific activation. So we use an antigen specific activation assay in which we have these K562 cell lines that express HLA-A2 and thus can present to our IGRP T cells or our um, DR4 expressing K562, which can present to our CD4 T cells. So when we look at early activation marker CD69, we can see that in our CD8 T cell avatars, we have upregulation here, and this is uh, compared to our no stimulation and those which don't have a TCR. And then we see a similar result in terms of the number of cells that are positive for CD25 at the later time point here. And we also see this mirrored in our CD4 T cell data. So next I wanted to assess uh, the functional implications of this knockout. In particular, uh, does knockout of the endogenous TCR increase cytotoxicity of our CD8 T cell avatars? So we perform a uh, CML assay here using beta LOX5 cells as the uh, target. And you can see at the one-to-one -one effector to target ratio, as well as the five-to-one effector to target ratio, we observe an increased percentage of cells that are positive for annexin-5 and perpidium iodide, um, indicated here for the cohort whole cohort where you can see that uh, our track knockout does seem to confer enhanced cytotoxic capabilities to these avatars. So now um, talking about bringing everything together, the iPSCs and the T cells, uh, we can use these iPSC derived cell lines in combination with cell avatars, uh, T cell avatars from the same donor in order to recapitulate these t uh, interactions that I mentioned at the top of the presentation. So here when we first talk about uh, the interaction of APCs with T cells. You can see that um, when we use our induced dendritic cells with that are pulsed with IGRP peptide, we can promote the proliferation of our IGRP specific T cell avatars. Next, when we talk about interactions of CD8 T cells with um, endothelial cells, you can see that when we flow our IGRP avatars over the autologous endothelial cells, which have been pulsed with the cognate antigen, we see an increased attachment here of our CD8 T cells as compared to those with no peptide and an irrelevant control. And lastly, talking about uh, functionality of these T cells in regards to being able to kill autologous beta cells, we see that 
the Autologous beta cells are able to be efficiently lysed by our avatars. And we found this to be not only um, antigen dependent, as you can see the differences in specific lysis uh, when the uh, antigen is present versus not, and was found to be uh, donor, uh, genotype dependent. So you can see in this donor who does not possess the relevant HLA-82 genotype, their uh, beta cells are not targeted. So to conclude here, uh, we've demonstrated efficiency in editing iPSC as well as uh, generating these different cell lines. Uh, we've also demonstrated that the induced dendritic cells promote CD8 T cell avatar proliferation, and these avatars are able to adhere to endothelial cells and lyse autologous beta cells. We've also demonstrated efficiency in editing the endogenous TCR in our T cell avatars, and we've shown that these avatars display increased antigen specificity and activation, while the CD8 T cells also display enhanced uh, cytotoxicity. In the future, we are going to generate iPSC derived uh, T cells and then use these in our gene editing workflow and assess their phenotype cytokine production profile uh, killing capacity. We also intend to apply this workflow to regulatory T cells. So in that case, we'll assess their uh, suppressive capacity. And then for all of these avatars, we intend to assess their uh, migratory capacity as well. Um, I'd like to acknowledge everyone in the Brusco lab for all their help with this, in particular, Dr. Wenyi Ye, who was really key in getting these um, gene editing experiments off the ground, my advisory committee, um, all the blood donors who uh, gave samples for all these experiments, and then our funding sources. Thank you so much, Theanna, for that wonderful summary of, of your amazing work. And um, there's some questions in the chat. Um, you guys keep them coming. We can certainly address some of them in the at the end of 10 minutes. But if the speakers so far want to answer any of those, they think they're quick questions, you can certainly do so. All right, we moved on to, to Daniel Steyer, who's in um, Dr. Roper's lab at FSU. All right, well, thanks for having me. Uh, okay, so today I'm gonna to talk about uh, some of the approaches we've uh, developing in order to sense the secretions from pancreatic islets. So uh, perfusion-based approaches uh, allow us to perform dynamic islet experimentation. So in a standard perfusion-based setup, you have islets in some sort of chamber in which we can continuously flow in nutrients and then desired stimuli to the surface of these islets. As the islets are, uh, as they uh, secrete analyte, these analytes can then be uptaken into this perfusion stream and flowed out to uh, further analysis. So microfluidics is a subset of these perfusion-based experiments where islets are housed inside of devices with micrometer scale channels. Uh, applying microfluidics for islet studies gives us a really great chance to uh, have a high degree of control over the, con the localized uh, islet environment that allows us to rapidly exchange uh, stimulus in towards the surface of the islets and better uh, mimic physiological conditions. The very low uh, volumes that we employ allow us to drastically reduce reagent consumption, which can be a huge cost saver when you consider uh, many people use things like ELISA kits, which uh, any uh, immune-based assays can get very expensive very quickly. Uh, the size of these devices makes them readily pairable with smaller islet populations, potentially allowing us to do studies down to single islets. And also, you'll see a lot of total analysis systems with these microfluidic devices, where you'll have a biological experimentation and then flow from those islets downstream to the addition of reagents, and then the actual detection event or the sensing of our islet secretions, uh, all within one microfluidic chip. Okay, so when we perform uh, on-chip secretion sensing, just as I uh, described, we're going to have a perfusion stream, uh, which has our analytes of interest in them. And we will be detecting the content of that stream within our microfluidic device. Uh, some advantages of doing this, we are able to automate our assay preparation. So we have continuous flows coming into our device. Our reagents can be continuously combined with our uh, anal our sample stream in order to create the assay of interest. Uh, our data acquisition is also continuous in such that we can, we will be making measurements throughout the entire experiment instead of collecting fractions and performing a single analysis per time point uh, later on. And then because our 
uh, analysis is on chip. It allows us to get data feedback extremely quickly. And so this can facilitate experimentation where the data from our experiments is used to shape the experiment as it's going forward. Now, uh, when we look to see how we can sense islet secretions, uh, there's some practical considerations to put in place. Uh, the first is just for any sort of chemical detection, you need some an assay that is both sensitive to your analyte of interest and also has the selectivity or the sensitivity necessary necessary uh, in order to do observe the amount coming off of your islets. Uh, a lot of assays require uh, massive time or major time for the incubation phase. So like an, an ELISA is a great for its sensitivity and selectivity, but it wouldn't be very pairable with microfluidic approaches where we want fast data feedback. Then also we, we're working with small microfluidic setups. So we don't want our, there are some uh, detection schemes that just physically are not parable with what we want to do. All right, so in the Roper lab, one of the assays we employed to sense uh, islet secretions is a competitive fluorescence anisotropy immunoassay. In this assay, insulin that's secreted from islets is mixed with an insulin-specific antibody in a fluorescently tagged derivative in of insulin, which we call insulin star. Uh, there's a limited amount of this antibody in solution. And so the, these two insulin and insulin star will compete for binding to this antibody or to the available antibody. Okay. Now, when we, uh, when we excite our fluorescently tagged insulin star with a polarized light, the degree of polarization coming off of the, uh, coming out of the emitted light is based off of the freedom of movement of our insulin star. And so we can measure this anisotropy value, which shows us that polarization based off of whether or not this insulin star is bound to the antibody in which it has a high degree of polarization in the emitted light, or if it's free in solution and there's a low degree of polarization in that light. And so as the insulin concentration in our sample stream increases, we'll see a decrease in that anisotropy value. Also, then we can put it as as we observe the anisotropy value, we can correlate it to the amount of insulin being released from our islets. So this has been employed on CHIP by our group. Uh, and the CHIP shown below in a chamber houses uh, pancreatic islets. The stream coming off of those islets is combined with streams of antibody and insulin star, which after a delay region where the, the um, reagents are allowed to mix, the insulin star is detected at the final point. And so this allows us to actively monitor the release of insulin from our pancreatic islets. Um, on the top trace, you can see the anisotropy value that we, that's the actual physical thing we're monitoring from our solution. And in the bottom, we correlate that to the amount of insulin that's being released. And then during a glucose, a uh, high glucose stimulation, we can see the the amount of insulin being secreted from the pancreatic islets increases and then going back down to low glucose concentration, moving back to the lower insulin secretion rates. Uh, so in, as a part of our uh, piece of the CHIP community, we've been improving upon that assay and also we developed a portable setup. It's a compact bench top setup in order to perform these measurements on microfluidic devices. And so within this device, we have all of the components necessary in order to perform anisotropy measurements, as well as a physical stage to place your microfluidic device on. And so in the setup, the laser light will come up through the stage into your device, exciting the insulin star within your sample stream. And then the emitted light that comes back down is then funneled to our uh, light detection system. All right, to improve upon this system, we're looking at uh, employing droplet microfluidics. In a droplet microfluidic system, our sample streams are broken down by an immiscible carrier phase. And so these individual droplet samples then are isolated from each other, which limits the diffusion of molecules from one point in the channel to the next and helps us to preserve time-based responses. Uh, we observed this effect when, in an experiment in which we were changing the concentration of our insulin star within a sample stream. We were going from a low concentration of that insulin star to a high concentration. Uh, when there was no droplet segmentation employed and it was just one continuous phase, it took about 45 seconds for us to see the change going from the low concentration to the high concentration as our analyte was free to move within our sample stream. 
when we locked it in place using droplet segmentation, we were actually able to then observe this change in a much more rapid manner, showing in under five seconds that we were moving from our low concentration to our high concentration, showing that we have a much greater uh, degree of temporal response that we can observe. And so we have applied this droplet-based measurements for looking at insulin within sample streams. Uh, on the left, just showing how we can actively monitor the anisotropy values from droplets using our fluorescence anisotropy immunoassay. Uh, on the left portion, you can see where we started at a low concentration, our high concentration of insulin moving up to a low concentration. And then also we've done a uh, quantitative work with this, and we've shown that we're getting the desired uh, analytical calibration curve for our assay and a detection limit that would allow us to observe insulin potentially down to single islet levels. All right, and so the final thing I have to go over today is something from our collaborators and at the University of Cincinnati uh, in the Ryan White's group. So they have developed electrochemical probes for detecting the secretions from pancreatic islets. Uh, they're based off of uh, aptamers being placed on the surface of the probes. Each aptamer has a redox active functional group attached to it. And the conformation of that redox active aptamer changes when it binds with the analyte of interest. So we have these, uh, elect these aptamers that are specific for a single analyte. In the case of what's shown here, that is insulin. And so as insulin is in the solution near the surface of the probes, we'll see a change in this, the current at the surface of our uh, of the electrochemical probes. Specifically for insulin, this was a decrease in the current as the redox probe changed its proximity in, to the electrochemical probe surface. And so as uh, the in concentration of insulin increases, we'll see that the signal at the surface of the probe decreases. And so finally, we employed this for uh, monitoring islet secretions. Uh, these, two, these electrochemical probes were put in line in the, uh, the, perf the perfusion stream after uh, being exposed to the islet. Uh, There's two probes put in place, one for ATP detection and one for insulin detection. And as we can see from both, we were able to actively monitor the changes in our sample streams based off of the response we were seeing at each of the different probes and how the signal changed over time. And uh, that's what I have for today. And I'd like to thank our collaborators, especially uh, Brian White's group and also the Hughes group, and then our funding from, uh, from the NIH. And I think I am done. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Daniel, for sharing uh, mm -hmm. your exciting work on, on uh, getting us cheaper insulin <laughs> assays. Um, I'm going to switch over to Dan, um, who's going to be talking about uh, the perfusible blood vessels and micro devices. Okay, so uh, I think we are about, we're about five minutes behind the schedule, so let me try to see uh, if we can. I don't want to take away your exciting time, <laughs> so it's okay. All right, so uh, I'll just dive right into it. Uh, just as a quick introduction, uh, research in my lab uh, basically revolves around developing these microfabricated devices, you know, called human organs on a chip uh, that we use to grow human cells, but we use micro and sometimes nanoengineering technologies to mimic very complex structures and dynamic environment of human tissues and organ units in ways that have not been possible using traditional cell culture techniques. So uh, we have a wide variety of model systems in our lab uh, mimicking different parts of the body, as some of which are shown here. But today what I'm gonna talk about is this question of how to engineer perfusible human blood vessels like the ones shown in this you know, movie. So this is actually the device that we use to achieve this goal. And uh, you're looking at the cutaway view of the device. And so just to give you a sense of scale from one end to the other of this channel in the horizontal direction is about one millimeter or actually two millimeters. Uh, from top to bottom is about 800 microns. So the unique design feature here, as you can see, is that uh, there are two barriers uh, sticking out from the ceiling of the channel. So what we can do in this system is that we inject liquid into the central lane. And because of surface tension, this liquid actually gets pinned along these barriers and never spills over to the side channels unless you ex apply excessive pressure. So this is actually a <clears throat> very well-known physics phenomena called the capillary pinning effect, uh, which is nicely demonstrated in this movie uh, using this black food coloring dye. 
So using this technique, uh, what we do is we inject hydrogel solution mixed with fibroblasts and endothelial cells. We gel it, we embed them in this ECM scaffold. We fill the side chambers with the media to feed the cells in the gel. And we uh, also seed uh, endothelial cells in the side channels. And over time, you know, these endothelial cells embedded in the CCM scaffold, in the presence of all the supporting factors produced by fibroblasts, they assemble themselves into 3D vessels that open to the side channels. So, so if you think about it, you know, this is what happens during embryogenesis. So, you know, mimicking this uh, developmental process of vasculogenesis in this microfluidic device. So this is a movie taken by uh, my graduate student, Andrei Georgescu, uh, that shows this process of vasculogenesis uh, that occurs over a period of four to seven days. And uh, these red endothelial cells are, you know, as you can tell, they develop this 3D vascular structure over time in this uh, microfluidic device. And as a result, we can form these beautiful, you know, 3D vessels across the entire thickness of the ECM scaffold. Uh, these vessels are uh, open, you know, vessels. They have open lumens, as you can see in this section. Uh, we have also developed a technique that allows us to extract and harvest these, you know, vascularized constructs after we form them for further analysis. So, for example, we can take it to the SEM core to get scan electron micrograph, as like the one shown here. Uh, we can do TM analysis. Uh, we've seen a lot of similarities between in vivo and in vitro vessels. I'm just going to skip for, for the interest of in the interest of time. I'm just going to skip the details here. Uh, we also have the ability to tune the architecture depending on how many cells we put into the gel, how stiff the gel is. So what I'm showing here are the all the same type of endothelial cells, but they show very different architecture as you can tell. And we're also using machine learning and AI, you know, techniques to quantify various features of these microengineered uh, blood vessels. And what I'm showing here is the uh, what happens at the interfaces. So if you look at uh, this interface between the gel and the side channels, uh, these green endothelial cells lining the side channels, they actually sprout into the gel and they start anastomosing. They, they start connecting with the 3D vessels in the uh, 3D ECM scaffold. And as a result, the vessels you know, open to the side channels and they become perfusible, uh, as you can see in this movie. I hope the movie is not too choppy on your end. Uh, we can also flow microparticles, nanobeads, um, and blood cells. This is actually very important. So uh, red blood cells on the left and uh, movie on the right shows T cells moving in uh, TNF treated inflamed blood vessels in our device. So we're now using this as a platform to uh, construct more realistic human tissues and organ units. And so let me just very quickly walk you through some of the examples of these model systems. So this is the study, as, you, as many of you know, uh, started as, as a result of NIDDK funding uh, several years ago as part of this uh, UC4 study led by Ben Stanger at Penn. Uh, we have developed this uh, pancreatic islet on a chip uh, where we can vascularize these cadaveric islets and we can maintain their function and viability for long periods of time. Uh, we can also induce adipogenesis and vasculogenesis at the same time to mimic uh, fat tissue, white adipose tissue in this case. Uh, this is actually a micro tumor actually in a, in a tumor on a chip. So in many of these model systems, we put explants, you know, uh, spheroids into our device along with fibroblasts and endothelial cells. And over time, as you can tell here, uh, they, you know, we can form heavily vascularized, you know, 3D tumor constructs and 3D tumor tissue structures in our devices. And because vessels are perfusible, these 3D structures also become perfusible, as you can tell. So in one example, I'm showing a lung tumor, actually, uh, that received the CAR T is engineered to recognize uh, mesothelium, one of, uh, one of the, you know, tumor antigens expressed by a variety of, you know, cancer uh, cell types, including uh, lung cancer. As you can tell, many of these CAR Ts uh, stick to the tumor associated vessels at, after a couple of hours in, after infusion. And many of these CAR Ts actually CAR, CARs, uh, infiltrate the tumor and they're found within the tumor uh, after a couple of days. And as a result of uh, T cell infiltration, we saw a very significant changes in the growth of tumors. And so uh, they exerted a very significant tumor killing effect on these uh, cancer cells. So we are basically doing, um, you know, things things that are. Let me actually see if I can play this movie. Yeah. So we are actually doing things that are very similar to what I sh showed you earlier, uh, in this, you know, uh, UEG3 UH3 study, and uh, we're 
aiming to uh, use this technology to uh, study immune islet interactions uh, in the context of type 1, type 1 diabetes. So there's so much more to talk about, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to stop here. And uh, this is my lab, and thank you, for, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dan Ha. I appreciate it. Um, and also for getting us like so quickly back on time. So thank you so much. No um, so there's tremendous diversity in the uh, presentations today. I hope that, um, oh yeah, there's a little poll uh, here that, that our Layla is coordinating. Um, so if you wouldn't mind answering that, but I, I hope that this has been informative and, and provided some, some information about uh, different tools that are available. Are there any questions? I noticed there was a couple questions. Uh, I can get started with that, but if you have any more and you want to just kind of go off mute, feel free to ask any questions. I had one for Dr. Tayton. Um, interesting that the T-cells need to be activated to allow for efficient capture of TCR pairing. How do you activate the T-cells and what stimulation and for how long? This is from Dr. Tang. Yeah, so we don't activate the T cells. We pull the cells from the peripheral blood, look for their state of activation. On the one that sequence well for T cell receptors are the ones that are activated. So we don't touch the cells in any way. We don't activate them ex vivo. Okay. Uh, Leanna, do you have a, any thoughts on that that you want to contribute as well? Yeah, I mean, we, we see the same problem in our single cell RNA sequencing data as well. Just the productive pairing is, is pretty low, um, but we, we've we neglected, we, we don't do any ex vivo stimulation. Also, we, we just want to keep the kind of native state of, of T cells as much as possible and identify what kind of phenotypes or, or uh, transcriptomic profiles define some clusters that may be more uh, preferentially detected in type 1 versus control. Great, thank you very much. Um, so there's a question for Daniel. Um, do you detect first and second phase glucose stimulated insulin secretion with typical kinetics? Yeah, so we can employ the system to observe like the standard uh, GSIS kinetics. Uh, I think one of the bigger points for what we can do is that we can observe past that. Uh, we can look at more rapid uh, changes in the, uh, the insulin release dynamics. So yeah, we can get the standard ones and then we're actually looking past that to see what we can observe. Wonderful, thanks. So we have a couple questions for, for Dan. Um, one from uh, Agarwal, thanks for sharing the beautiful work as always. How to seed and or recover the spheroids from your vascularized chip? Yeah, so for seeding, we basically uh, preform the spheroids off chip and you know using low attachment wells. Um, and then we mix them with uh, uh, other cell types in ECM hydrogel solution. And uh, we inject the mixture into the device uh, for gelation and for performing the, uh, the ECM scaffold. So that's what we do for seeding. Uh, for harvesting these asparagus, uh, we actually, you know, the technique I was talking about, you know, uh, during my talk, uh, this is the technique where we actually apply mechanical forces to peel apart the layers to act you know get access to the tissue directly so we have a ways to uh, pull these tissues out of the devices after debonding the layers and then we uh, you know use enzymes actually to dissociate you know or the, kind of disrupt the other uh, tissue to get the spheroids out i hope that uh, answered your question ashu yeah i did thank you dan yeah. So another question is cancer tumors would have quote natural pull for vascularization, but if we want to apply this to say pancreatic islet clusters, would we need to add growth factors to make vascularization happen? Great question. Yeah, so we actually were spending a lot of time, you know, trying to optimize the optimal conditions, you know, uh, conditions for vascularization in this system. So uh, the real challenge is actually we're, you know, setting out to create isogenic model so that's actually in the works. But so far, using, you know, those, uh, so for example, the, the last movie I showed you, so uh, that model was created using HLA uh, A1 positive, you know, patient uh, eyelid section, then uh, HLA, A, HLA A1 ne uh, sero negative, you know, cell types. And then we used the HLA A1 uh, cards actually to 
to, you know, uh, look at the interactions. But so we have, you know, uh, model systems that I think are fairly working fairly well, but, uh, you know, we're now focusing on developing the isogenic, you know, model. I know this is not a, you know, satisfactory answer to that question, but, you know, so that's actually, you know, information I can provide at this point. Um, we have a couple asking about endothelial cell source. So what endothelial cells are used to create? Any differences between HUVEX and other tissue specific or even the IPSC derived endothelial cells? Can you comment on that? Yeah, so we've tried all of the, all of the above actually. So uh, we've had a lot of success with pancreatic microvascular endothelial cells, you know, uh, obtained from uh, commercial vendors like Lonza. So uh, they uh, grow fairly well in our devices and they also, they're very good at making these 3D, you know, perfusible vessels. Uh, we've also tried, you know, we, we use Humex a lot, you know, as other labs do, because they're easy to use. And uh, one of the movies actually I showed you uh, had uh, RIP expressing Humex. So these Humex are great for just you know, testing and, you know, uh, just for optimization purposes. But when it comes to modeling the tissue specific interactions, we, uh, you know, make every effort to use organ specific tissue specific cells. Uh, we've also used uh, IPS-derived endothelial cells, and we've seen some interesting results that suggest that the, uh, the changes in phenotype of these cells, initially they're somewhat uncommitted, so to speak, uh, but uh, when they're in contact or when they're in the same environment as you know, tissue-specific, organ-specific cells, we've seen them actually take on you know, more organ-specific phenotypes. You know? so, uh, you know, we are using all of, all of these different kinds of endothelial cells to construct our model systems. Wonderful, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, are there other questions? Anybody wants to just come off mute and ask a question? No, Dan, there was a quick one about the distance between the two liquid tunnels. I don't know if you just want to type that in the chat. Um, yeah, I'll do that, yeah. Uh, just to give time for about two minutes left. Does anybody have any burning questions they'd like to ask? Applications they want to discuss? could chat it as well. Okay. Well, if there's no further questions, <laughs> how can we become a member of Kern? Um, <laughs> Joyce, you want to answer that one? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just wanted to thank all the speakers. Excellent job. It was really a, a fascinating uh, presentation. And thank you to all of you who attended. Appreciate the interest. Yes, thank you guys. And I hope that, you know, now that you have some contact information, if you see, um, if you're interested in any of these topics and want to reach out, please feel free to reach out directly to the investigators involved. Thank you all. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Layla, do you want us to hang on for anything? Or? Um, I think we're good. I have to run to get my daughter from school, and I just responded to that last question, so hopefully he saw it. Wonderful. <laughs> do you want me to end this polling? Yeah, um, yes. Oh, wait, let me take a screenshot. I got it. You got it? Okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you guys so much. Amazing job. Such just exciting work. It's been really fun. Lots of, lots of learning no, curve. It. Worked out well. Yes. Good job, guys. Thanks. Okay, take care. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Layla. Bye-bye.